Thank you. Norman Jeffrey Healy, born in Toronto, on March 25, 1966, was raised in the city's West End. He was adopted when he was just a baby. His dad was a firefighter. At only one year old, he had lost his sight to retinoblastoma, a rare form of eye cancer. His eyes had to be surgically removed and replaced with prosthetic glass eyeballs, which are called ocular prostheses. And as he grew up, he would get impatient with people who tried to sympathize with his disability. He just wanted to be a normal guy. Jeff would find out later that people with this retinoblastoma were likely to get another kind of cancer eventually, 50-50 odds, and that is exactly what would happen to him, however not before he made a huge dent in the rock and the blues world. Jeff Healy started playing guitar when he was three, and he even had his own way of playing it, flat on his lap. This wasn't a technique born from his blindness, but really just because he was a little kid and could barely hold the guitar in a traditional way because it was so big and heavy but that playing style stuck. At nine years old, they put him on a TV Ontario show called Cucumber to show off his musical chops. And by 15, Healy, already considered a monster player, started a band called Blue Direction with his buddy. You gotta keep trucking, I think is the main thing. You just don't let things bother you. If you play primarily to please yourself, and get satisfaction out of it and uh, spur yourself on, I think that's the main thing. Because I mean, there's just no way you can please 100% of your audience all the time. They were a four-piece, playing mostly covers and bars. They played gigs in Toronto, hitting up places like the Colonial Tavern. At 19, Jeff was rocking out at Grossman's Tavern, a Toronto dive bar known for its love of the blues and willingness to give new artists a shot. <laughs> was going nuts on their feet cheering him on as he ripped into this blues rock thing but there was this one guy in the audience who just couldn't be bothered he was an a and r guy working for the canadian arm of a huge record label he listens to the crowd watches them and then with a sniff he muttered this blues shit is never gonna last and he went on to say anyway the kid needs a gimmick well jeff would definitely prove him wrong in the years to come jeff healy started hosting a jazz and blues show on ciut fm radio playing tunes from his absolutely massive collection of old 78 RPM records. His record collection was the stuff of legend. His suburban Toronto basement was a total mess, stuffed with a whopping 27,078 RPM records, all organized in custom-made shelves. Jeff was all about dance band music, especially stuff in the 20s, 30s, and the 40s with a bit of jazz thrown in for good measure. But there wasn't any kind of fancy labeling going on. They were just all crammed pretty much in a pile, touching each other all beat up and scratched. But he was like a magician, and he could find anything that he needed in a flash. For instance, when someone straight up asked him if he had any records by this obscure British band called Harry Roy, Jeff jumped out of his chair, rushed to the shelves, and just by feel instantly knew which record it was. And his record collection was mostly from his time in Australia, because back then, Finding cool records was a piece of cake because nobody in that particular area was into it at the time. So the secondhand stores were full of all sorts of treasures, unlike in Canada and the US. When Jeff was just itching to hear the record, so he went out and snagged himself a used hand-operated gramophone. And then he just went totally nuts making phone calls to all his friends in Canada to share his music discoveries, racking up a huge phone bill in the process. Because back in those days, long distance calls were definitely not cheap. Not long after, Jeff Healy met bassist Joe Rockman and drummer Tom Steffen, and the three of them started the Jeff Healy Band. Their first public appearance was at the Bird's Nest, which is a place upstairs at Chicago's Diner in Queen Street in West Toronto. Not long after, the band got a shout-out in Toronto's Now magazine, and they were gigging almost every night in places like Grossman's Towers and the legendary Albert's Hall, the same place where Jeff Healy would get noticed by Stevie Ray Vaughan and Albert Collin. The Jeff Healy band landed a deal with Arista Records in 88, and their album See the Light hit the RPM Top 100 the next year. They had a huge hit called Angel Eyes, and another track called Hideaway that even got nominated for a Grammy, for best rock instrumental performance. And right out of the gate, they're one of the busiest bands around, simultaneously recording See the Light while also filming Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze and even making the soundtrack for it. And Healy was practically a fixture on the set, 
sometimes acting along Swayze since his band was a main act in the bar and the film. And they ended up snagging the Juno Award for Canadian Entertainer of the Year in 90. And Healy racked up a whopping 10 Canadian chart hits between 1990 and 1994, thanks to his albums Hell to Pay and Feel This. He also scored a hit with the cover of the Beatles' While My Guitar Gently Weeps, which actually featured George Harrison himself, as well as Jeff Lynne, on backing vocals. And the Jeff Healy band packed out gigs and festivals. Jeff became widely respected among some of the most influential musicians of the day, performing with Bonnie Raitt, Buddy Guy, Albert Collins, Eric Clapton, B.B. King, ZZ Top, and Ian Gillen from Deep Purple, among others. And Jeff really was much more about doing the edgier blues rock. Singing Angel Eyes was actually getting pretty old. So the Jeff Healy Band's second album, Hell to Pay, was dropped on May 25th, 1990. The album was a pretty big deal, showing off his crazy skills and making him a real player in the music world. Hell to Pay also featured some big-name artists all over it and did extremely well on the shelf. In terms of production, it's got that late 80s feel. But due to the organic vibe and the performance alone, the work never sounds dated. If anything, it's just some good heavy blues rocking at its best. Though so some of his later work would have a bit more edginess to it here and there. The title track, Hell to Pay, satisfies that crossover between hard rock and blues itch with some nice slick guitar lines woven throughout along with his smooth vocal. Another standout, the track I Can't Get My Hands On You is much in the same vein with some really cool guitar harmonies throughout. And then when the main solo kicks in, it shows just how ferocious he was with those wah-drenched lines. Jeff's gear and guitar selections around this time are an interesting story in and of themselves. He started with a first edition electric guitar, which is a Maple SG copy without branding on the headstock. And that was bought from Hudson Music in Toronto. He then got a black Squire Strat with a giant 70s headstock Maple fretboard. He also got a hold of a red Japanese Squire, with two humbuckers from Musician Supply in Mississauga. After meeting Steve Ray Vaughan, Jeff was inspired to switch to heavier strings, but for the movie Roadhouse, he actually used the black JB Squire with red single-coil Evans pickups. Now, these Squires were highly regarded, often considered as good or better than Fenders at the time, and Jeff would actually stick with Squires throughout the rest of his career, customizing them with Rod Evans pickups from Victoria, the Evans Eliminators pickup had a thick, rich sound with strong mid-range and a high output, perfect for that loud, intense style. His favorite was a black Squire Strat with the Evans pickups and a bolted-on tremolo, and he also owned a rare Jackson Siamese double neck, which he had purchased in LA in 1988. This guitar featured a 12-string neck on the top, a 6-string on the bottom, with joined headstock, and he used it for touring and the video for Angel Eyes and When the Night Comes Falling from the Sky. And besides the Evans single coils, he would also use the Seymour Duncan SH-5 pickup. But like any accomplished guitar player, he had a revolving door of guitars and parts. Anything from 1940s Gibson L12 arch top with added pickups to a Les Paul that he used throughout the late 90s. And as far as amp choices, that pretty much evolved from Marshall JCM-800 half stack to a Pro Tube Twin and Pro Junior for Jazz Wizards gigs. And like a lot of guitar players, he also favored a Boss GE7 Graphic EQ, which served two purposes, one of them being to drive the front end of the amp a little harder, and the other one to help shape the sound and really bring out the overtones and the frequencies that he wanted. Now in 1992, the Jeff Healy band released Feel This, and it shows them growing musically. Production-wise, it still has that 80s sheen to it, but the music was starting to become a little bit more evolved and even actually a bit more edgy in some place. Jeff was really digging the wah-wah pedal by this time, but he used it really tastefully, and it gave his solos a lot more bite and attitude. The first track, A Cruel Little Number, is a good time hard rock blues tune and a perfect start to the album. And a real standout on this one is if you can't feel anything else, and it shows his band and him getting down with their funky selves. Jeff even actually tries his hand at rapping, which is pretty cool, interspersed with his vocal. A lot of nice energy to this track with some mild chorus on the distorted guitar to give it a little bit extra dimension. But this album overall really shows the band stretching their musical boundaries at this point. Now for the next album, cover to cover, their sound is much more defined. The production didn't quite have the 80s feel of their previous releases, starting out with Shapes of Things, which is more of an instrumental version to the Jeff Beck and Rod Stewart arrangement. Now this was a song that was originally done by the Yardbird. 
and just playing is on full display here pulling out all the stops where he plays the vocal line of it very tastefully but with a really good hard rocking intensity and then when that solo kicks in look out a lot of intense passionate bends combined with some really cool legato work shows how clean and precise his playing was and even though it was cut in the studio it has such a live feel to it on this album jeff also covered stuck in the middle with you where he incorporated his rock and blues influences perfectly a nice fiery wah solo rounds this one out and for his cover of communication breakdown he brings it all back with a very bluesy rendition it's definitely hard rock but he went instrumental with the harmonica and the guitars sharing the vocal line and then it just goes off in a completely different direction and jeff goes into full shred mode this one in particular was a really great display of Jeff's guitar chops. For the final album with the Jeff Healy band called Get Me Some released in 2000, the sound was fully modernized. Starting out with a scorcher called Which One, Jeff's voice was as smooth as it had ever been. It's a standout track on the album, but in terms of his more harder rocking songs, it is head and shoulders above most. It has some infectious vocal lines and the guitar rhythms are tight as hell. And he certainly didn't hold back his lead guitar chops in this one going all out in the high registers and just wailing. The entirety of this album is a bit lighter than some of his earlier efforts with a really good collection of ballads. But when he did get rocking, he certainly brings it on tracks like Which One and also Houses Burning Down, the latter track having almost a Hendrix vibe going on. The vocals on this one are awesome as are the rhythm guitars. And it really hits a nice funk breakdown setting up for one of his all out hard rocking solos, which fits perfectly with the underlying chord progression. And Jeff also had formed a jazz band called Jeff Healy and the Jazz Wizards. And with them, he put out four albums of seriously upbeat classic jazz tunes. They're all inspired by the likes of Louis Armstrong, Hoagie Carmichael, and a few other big names. And he also put out a box set with three CDs covering every track Armstrong had recorded with the Fletcher Henderson band back in the 20s. Jeff Healy really looked up to Louis Armstrong, and he himself played trumpet on those records. Jeff also produced Canadian jazz singer Tara Hazelton's debut album, Anybody's Baby. And while Jeff wasn't exactly a horn virtuoso, his enthusiasm when he played was undeniable and it was clear that he was having a total blast. Back at home in Toronto, he had his own club, Healy's, on Bathurst Street. Every Thursday, he'd jam with his blues band, and then on Saturdays, he'd switch gears and play jazz with his other group. And they ended up actually upgrading, moving to a bigger spot on 56 Blue Jays Way, renaming the whole thing Jeff Healy's Roadhouse. Healy was a regular there, but he wasn't the boss. He was just a frequent customer. That's pretty much how he liked to look at it. Jeff's last album, Mess of Blues, dropped in March of 2008, just a couple weeks after Healy had passed away. They had recorded four of the album's tracks live, with two at the Islington Academy in London and the other two at Jeff Healy's Roadhouse in Toronto. They laid down six other tracks in Toronto at Studio 92. The entire record features the band that usually backed Jeff up at his club, and the song mess of blues the title track was penned by doc palmas and mort schumann and this was a song that elvis presley had actually recorded back in the day as well the album finds jeff returning to his pure blues roots but not without that rocking hard edge that jeff had become known for though sadly he would die in an untimely fashion this album proved to be a fitting closer for him he was able to bring the blues in a raw and more rugged style but still with the level of polish that he had always brought to everything that he had done up to that point. Jeff was set to hit the road in April 2008 with his other band, the Jeff Healy Blues Band, for a string of shows in the UK, Germany, and the Netherlands, but sadly he would die before he could actually make that happen. On January 11, 2007, Jeff Healy had surgery to remove some tumors from both of his lungs. He had a rough couple of years, having two sarcomas removed from his legs within the last 18 months of that period. On March 2nd, 2008, Jeff Healy had died at 41 years old in his hometown of Toronto. He was laid to rest at Park Lawn Cemetery in Etobicoke, Ontario. Jeff put a huge dent in the music world. He was a legend revered by legend. B.B. King praised Jeff's unique style and execution, declaring him better than Stevie Ray Vaughan, Stanley Jordan, and even himself. And this endorsement, along with Stevie Ray Vaughan's, helped legitimize Jeff's talents and shake off the novelty label that he had often faced. Over the next two decades, Jeff and B.B. would cross paths multiple times, leading to epic jams. 
BB affectionately called Jeff his Canadian son and praised him as a hell of a bluesman. Jeff Healy performed at BB King's 70th birthday concert and the opening of BB King's Club in New York. The two maintain a really close relationship with Jeff expressing his fortune in knowing BB so well. When informed of Jeff's passing in a 2008 interview, BB King was completely stunned repeatedly just saying I didn't know and expressing deep emotion. And Jeff Healy had crossed paths with Stevie Ray Vaughan in 1985. Healy was just 19 at the time, and he had bumped into Vaughan and Albert Collins at Toronto's legendary Albert's Hall during a spontaneous jam. The two met and instantly hit it off, becoming good friends and respecting each other's music. Jeff Healy and Stevie Ray Vaughan weren't shy about sharing the stage, teaming up for gigs a bunch of times over the years. They had a killer jam session at CBC Studios in Toronto back in 87. And they had great stage chemistry, so they just kept performing together whenever the opportunity would strike. They also played the Sky Dome in Toronto back in 89, opening for Jeff Beck. On August 27, 1990, the world lost Stevie Ray Vaughan in a tragic helicopter crash. And just days before, Vaughan had shared a bill with Jeff Healy, Eric Clapton, Buddy Guy, Robert Cray, and Jimmy Vaughan at the Alpine Valley in East Troy, Wisconsin. Stevie's death at 35 deeply affected Jeff Healy, who had recalled walking near the crash site with Stevie the night before. And this channel has covered Stevie Ray Vaughan in depth. Be sure to check out that video as well. But Jeff Healy's gigging career was illustrious to say the least. He jammed with and was respected by some of the biggest heavy hitters in music. Healy was also a bit of a talent scout, discovering and helping out artists like Alex Pangman, Tara Hazelton, Amanda Marshall, Shannon Kerfman, and others. His album Mess of Blues won Best Blues Album at the Independent Music Awards in 2009. And Healy got a pretty sweet honor posthumously in 2009, where he was inducted into the Terry Fox Hall of Fame. And that's a big honor considering who Terry Fox was, as he was an athlete who dedicated his life to fighting cancer, losing a leg to cancer in 80, but being completely unstopped by it. He decided to run across Canada from east to west, lasting 143 days and over 5,000 kilometers. Toronto's Woodford Park ended up getting a new name in 2011, being called Jeff Healy Park, which was a fitting tribute to the legendary guitar player. Healy also got a star on Canada's Walk of Fame in 2014. Jeff Healy wasn't just a killer musician. He also gave back through a ton of charity work. After his own struggle with eye cancer, he threw himself into helping charities that support kids with the same disease. Healy was a big supporter of charities like Daisy's Eye Cancer Fund, now called the World Eye Cancer Hope. See the link in the description, which helps kids with retinoblastoma. He did a ton of benefit concerts for them, and he set up in such a way that even... After his passing, he was still able to give back through his estate. For example, in 2016, they threw a massive concert to celebrate what would have been his 50th. And the whole thing turned out to be a fundraiser for the World Eye Cancer Hope. The Healy Family Foundation, set up to keep Jeff's memory alive, throws money at a ton of different charities, from education to science. And Jeff Healy's fans kept supporting his charitable work even after he had passed away. While Jeff was alive, he was seriously dedicated to eye cancer research, education, and it really shows how much one person could do when they really care about a cause. And alongside his music, Jeff managed to leave a huge mark on the world. Through it all though, Jeff Healy was one of a kind. And the story shows that you can achieve anything if you really put your mind to it, even if everybody tells you it's impossible. Healy's music is awe-inspiring, not just because he's a technical wizard, but because he always really put his heart and soul into every single note he played. He overcame some really crazy challenges and built something amazing. Just a big huge thanks and high five to my subs. I really appreciate your comments and feedback and I really just want to thank you so much for that. And if you haven't had a chance to subscribe to the channel, make sure you smack that subscribe button. And while you're at it, kindly hit like. I do appreciate it. I really want to thank you so much for watching.